Amen. All right. Uh, tonight we're in Genesis chapter number 48. It actually begins the context of chapter number 48 and chapter number 49, which is the blessings that are bestowed upon the children of Israel. Now, primarily, tonight we're going to be dealing with the blessing of Joseph, which is predominantly focusing on the blessings of his two sons, his offspring, and that is Ephraim and Manasseh. And there's a lot of interesting little nuggets in this particular chapter right here. So let's go ahead and begin with verse number 1. Chapter Chapter number 48, verse number 1, the Bible reads, And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Verse 2, And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat and sat upon the bed. So he was, of course, lying down. He was very sick at this time. Verse 3, And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and blessed me, and said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful, and multiply thee. And I will make, I will make of thee a multitude of people, and will, give the, and will give this land, excuse me, and will give this land to thy seed after thee, for an everlasting possession. So it begins there with Joseph receiving the news that his, that his father is sick. Now if you remember when his father showed up, he was obviously very well aged. What was he? 147, I believe, at that time. So he's very well aged and uh, you, know, you wouldn't expect to live much longer than that. Now when he shows up here, when the man comes to him and tells him that his father is sick, notice that he brings with him Ephraim and Manasseh both. Now there is a purpose for that and I'm going to show you that both Jacob and Joseph is, is aware of the reason why. Uh, Jacob is aware of why Ephraim and Manasseh are coming to him and, 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 and Joseph is bringing them and then also uh, e Joseph knows that Jacob is going to be aware of the reason why he's bringing them and it is for the blessing. I'm going to show you that. Now notice number one that in the very beginning, right here in verse number 2, it says, And one told Jacob, and said, Behold, thy, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. Now notice that, that he is aware that he needs to sit up, that something is about to take place, right? He sits up upon the bed and he strengthens himself. Right as soon as he gets in there, verse number 3, it says, And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and bless me. So he goes into the introduction. As soon as he walks in the door, he talks about the, the blessing that was bestowed upon him. Now, of course, the offspring of Jacob is very well aware that this blessing is conferred. It is passed down to one of the children, right? And of course, he gives a specific blessing unto all of the children, but there is the right of the firstborn and all these other special blessings that, you know, Joseph receives a special blessing. Judah receives a special blessing. So they're all aware of the conference and of the passing down of this blessing. And I'm going to get more into that in just a moment. Notice there at verse number 4 at the very end as well, he says, he talks about a specific aspect of this blessing. He says this, And will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. Now, that's of course Joseph. That's a court, that is of course Ephraim and Manasseh. So notice how this blessing, the very beginning, he, he starts speaking about it and he talks about how it pertains unto Joseph. He talks about how it pertains unto Ephraim and Manasseh. Now look at verse number 5. I want you to look with me at verse number 5. It says this, And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, before I came unto thee into Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Now, I alluded to this last week when uh, I was speaking about, actually, uh, no, it was last week, when I was speaking about, you know, the supposed uh, discrepancy, right? When it talks about how many souls, you know, went down into Egypt and all of that. So, I went through that and I talked about how, you know, the number of the children of Israel and how the tribes are actually named. Oftentimes, it will, it will totally eliminate Joseph and then it'll add, you know, uh, the two in its place, right? It'll, it'll add Manasseh and Ephraim in its place. And right here we can actually see the, the statement of why that is so. And when that began to be so, that takes place right here. And he even explains that very clearly what he means by it. Because he gives you an example. He says this. He says, uh, Which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt before I came unto thee in Egypt. Talking about Manasseh and Ephraim. And then he says this. He says, Are mine. 
So he's saying they are his. Now he goes on and says this. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. So he explains what he means by that in the same way that Reuben is his direct son, right? The same way that Simeon is his offspring, he is reckoning or considering Ephraim and Manasseh to be his children, that they are of you know, his offspring in that way. He actually speaks about that a little bit more. Keep looking in verse 6. In thy issue, so he's saying your children, now he's talking specifically about this, which thou begettest after them. So he says, in thy issue, which thou begettest after them. So the children that you're going to have going forward now, the children you're going to have after Ephraim and Manasseh, shall be thine and shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. So he says, so the children that you have now, after Ephraim and Manasseh, you can keep them. Now this is, of course, speaking specifically about the genealogy. You know, uh, about how they are reckoned, what tribe they come from. You know, the name, it's somewhat similar to, you know, let's say that if a man, the law in the Bible, that if a man has a wife and the man dies, his brother is supposed to marry that woman and then raise up seed unto his brother. That child or that offspring of that, that marriage of the brother who now married his dead brother's wife, he now raises up that child in the name of his dead brother. He gives that child's name and he is known as being his brother, not his own, but his brother's offspring. That's basically what is going on here in this situation. He's saying the children that you have going forward after Ephraim and Manasseh, you can claim them or you can reckon them to your genealogy. But as far as you know, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, they are considered mine. They are the offspring of Jacob. And like I said, that's why many times throughout the Bible, when the 12 tribes of Israel are mentioned, amongst those 12 are Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, who, who are the 12? There, of course, you would think of the 12 sons of Israel. Now, there are some people that are eliminated here. And there are all different types of changes. There's one time when Simeon's not mentioned, one time when Dan's not mentioned. Um, you have when the, the, the portions are given of the land, the Levites don't get a portion because, you know, they are the Lord's, right? God takes them and uses them as the priest. And then that's how you have two. You, so Levites are gone. Now you have 11. You know, then you just take Joseph himself. He's gone. Now you have two available spaces. Ephraim and Manasseh are then plugged into those two spots. So that's how they are reckoned. So those are all. The, the other ten would be Israel's children. But then you have his grandchildren, which are reckoned or considered just like being his direct offspring. And then that's further proven by the fact that when he speaks to Joseph there, he goes, he goes on furthermore and says, hey, the children that you have from now on, you can consider them your direct offspring, right? They will be your children, and they would be considered, of course, Jacob's grandchildren. But he says, but as far as Ephraim and Manasseh, they are mine. Now, this is pertaining to the blessing, right? And what does the blessing have to do with it? It has to do with, you know, you, you could say the physical land, of course, and then, of course, there's the spiritual application as well. There are two applications to that, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the physical and the spiritual. Look at verse number uh, um, look at verse number six one more time. We'll finish the end of it. He says, And thy issue which thou begettest after them shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. Verse 7. And as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way which yet there was but a little way to come unto Ephrath. And I buried her there in the way of Ephrath. The same is Bethlehem. Now we turn to this one other time, but this is a good definition of where Ephrath is and another name of it. Uh, it is also Bethlehem. They are one and the same. Look at verse number uh, 8 now. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons. Now Israel, of course, is Jacob. And said, Who are these? Verse number, I want you to skip down to verse number 10 because some people could be like, that's kind of bizarre. Why does he not know who his grandchildren are? You know, keep in mind he's very sick. He's sickly. Look at verse 10. It tells you why. Now the eyes of Israel were dimmed for age so that he could not see. So it's not that he doesn't know his grandchildren. Like he's obviously in very bad condition to the point where he's not even able to look and recognize, you know, his own grandchildren when they're standing right before him. So he's very, very sick. Verse number 9. And Joseph said unto his father, they are my sons whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I, will and I will bless them. Now, verse 10 again. Now the eyes of Israel 
were dim for age, so that he could not see. And he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them and embraced them. So, he, you know, his eyesight must have degraded, you know, drastically. This is something that happens very often. It's very interesting because oftentimes it's spoken of, and it happens with, with elderly people as well today, but it seems like in the Bible it's much more profound. And uh, our health today goes downhill for multiple reasons. You know, they were, at that time, you know, I, I'll give you a perfect example of this. Think about what Caleb said when he stood up and he was ready, when he made the famous quote, you know, I want that mountain, right? He said, you know, when he was 80 years old, 40 years had went by, he said that, you know, his, 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 that he still had his eyesight. And he, he made a statement, he said this, that his natural force was not abated, you know, even unto the end of his life. It's saying that, you know, uh, he still had the power that he was given, you know, from the beginning, naturally. His physical, natural characteristics that he had, he still had that strength. You know, and his faculties, if you will. He still had all of those things, which is very different, obviously. When we, you know, as we grow older, you know, uh, we start to lose eyesight. We start to lose all different types of faculties, strength, and things like that. And we can see that that's happened with Israel. Remember that it also happened uh, with uh, Isaac. That the same thing happened where he was, he was sickly, wasn't able to see very well. He couldn't even recognize Esau. So this was very common. The reason being because people would, uh, they would live longer and their health was better as far as in a lot. We die, people, people die off today from all different types of cancers, from all the different types of you know, liver disorders, heart problems, conditions. There you can see you know, uh, people were living longer to the point to where when they, they're, all of their abilities are just basically going downhill even. Their natural force is abated. A lot of times people will die when they're able to walk around, they have their strength, they have their eyesight today, you know, because people don't care about their health as much as they did at that time. And plus, it's, you know, uh, um, we're affected more so today by all different types of egg problems and stuff being put into our food and all other kinds of issues that they didn't have to deal with at that time. Look at uh, verse number 10 now. It says, And he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them and embraced them. Verse 11, And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face. And lo, God hath showed me also thy seed. So I'm sure there's a couple of moments there were, you know, uh, very significant moments to uh, uh, Jacob or to Israel. You've got to think that he is at, at the moment of, you know, he's on his deathbed. He's getting very close to the end of his life. And, and uh, this is getting ready to be the blessing. Obviously, why is the blessing being given right now? Because he knows that he's close to the end of his life. And he's, he's of course, rejoicing right now. And, he's, and he's, uh, he's happy about the blessing of being able to see Joseph. And then he goes further and says at this moment, while he's kissing and while he's embracing, you to keep it all in context, his grandchildren, he says, while he's doing that to them, he, he says to Joseph that I didn't expect to even see your face. And then he goes on to say that God hath showed me also thy seed. So even a, a, an extra blessing there where he even got to see you know, his grandchildren before he died. So you can see that he's, you know, he's, he's enjoying this moment with his grandchildren here, uh, you know, which is a significant moment, getting close to the end of his life. Verse number 12, it says this, And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. So between his knees, obviously, you know, his children are, are very small still. They're very uh, uh, small because if you think of uh, the time in which he had the, his kids, after he, when, he, when he was taken out of prison, right around that time period, remember that there was seven years that went by and then an additional seven. And throughout that period of time, he was given his wife, you know, which was uh, uh, Potiphar's uh, uh, um, uh, daughter, right? Who was the Potiphar the priest. He was given uh, his, uh, his daughter and he married her during that time. So he may have had the kids right at the beginning of maybe when the blessing be, or the, the curses began of the famine. After the blessings were all over and the famine began. And uh, at the most, the children would be possibly, you could say, uh, five, six years old. Because they're still in the middle of the famine. The, the oldest could be five or six. And you could even uh, say that the younger one at the oldest could be maybe, you know, four or five, if he had them at that point. But even still, I mean, let's say that he's an average height person. Let's say he's 5'10". You know, if he brought them out between his knees, you know, they're at least, their head is at least to the height of his belt. You know, uh, no, no more than that if they're between his knees. And when children are somewhat shy, that's the kind of position they would go into where they're kind of trying to hide themselves. So they're standing there with their father. And it says, And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. So notice that. 
showed humility. Verse 13, And Joseph took them both. Ephraim in his right hand, now this gets important here, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand. That's of course because they're facing one another, it's going to be opposite. So towards Israel's left hand and Manasseh in his left hand, that's Joseph's left hand, toward Israel's right hand. Now who's the oldest of the two? Manasseh is the oldest of the two, right? So notice that he, he positioned them in a very specific way. Right? He positioned him in a very specific way. He has Manasseh facing Jacob or Israel's right hand while he has Ephraim facing Jacob or Israel's left hand. Joseph was the one that did this. This was, this was his conjuring up or his idea when he brought them forward to his father for the blessing. Now, why did he do that? Now, the, the right hand in the Bible is given emphasis oftentimes. It talks about the right hand of the Lord. It talks about the right arm of the Lord, right? You know, uh, it's given precedence in ways. The, the right arm represents salvation and things like that. And I think the basic answer to why that is is because the majority of people are right-handed. And uh, even, even at that time, the majority of people were right-handed. And the way in which you can prove that is because if you remember in the story of Judges 19 where the Sodomites come in, you have the men of Gibeah, right? Uh, and uh, they are living with the Benjamites in the area of the Benjamites. Well, they come out to fight against the Israelites and it talks about these men being all left-handed. Now, why would you point that out if everyone was, you know, if the majority were left-handed? Of course, this is something we look around on the earth today, and it's, and it's, and it's hereditary. The majority of people are just right-handed. So that makes perfect sense why the right hand would take precedence. The majority are right-handed. Most people, that is their strong hand. So that's why he knows, and this is a custom, that when it, whoever he places his right hand on, Israel that is, he is going to have precedence. Whoever is placed in Israel's right hand is going to be given precedence. They are going to be considered you know, superior in that sense, right? So that's why Joseph did that. Look at verse number 14. It says, And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head. So he stretches out his right hand and then he lays it upon Ephraim's head. So where was Ephraim located? Well, Ephraim would have been right in front of Jacob's or Israel's left hand, right? So Ephraim, if I am Jacob, Ephraim would be right here in relation to me. Well, Israel, when he reaches out, he doesn't just go out naturally like this, just straight out. He reaches his right hand across and puts his right hand upon Ephraim's head. It says, And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger. And his left hand upon Manasseh's head. And then it says this, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. So basically, he's kind of in an awkward position where his hands are like crossed one another, right? And it tells you there that he was guiding his hands wittingly, right? So wittingly is like knowingly. When it said, you know, when we say, hey, some, that, you know, somebody says, you know, so, or they are a witty person, right? It's a person that is knowledgeable, right? If they tell a witty joke, it's normally a joke that has some wisdom to it, right? It was a well thought out joke. That's what that means. So wittingly just means knowing. Saying he was aware of this. This was not an accident. He did this purposely. So he crossed his hand. So now his right hand, which would be the superior, right? His right hand is upon the younger, that is Ephraim's head, and then his left hand is upon Manasseh's head, the oldest. Verse 15 it says, And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. So lads there is referring to the young boys, right? And let my name be named on them. And the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. And let them grow into a multitude in the midst of 
the earth. Now he, he uh, goes back, he references that same thing that he had said earlier when he makes the statement, he says, and let my name be named on them. He says, my name be named on them. Remember before he said that Ephraim and Manasseh, he said they are going to be mine, just like Reuben and Simeon are mine. So that's why he makes that statement. That's what that means when he says, and let my name be named on them. They are, of course, known as being the tribes of Israel, the children of Israel. So they have a name of prominence, a greater name of prominence that they would not have uh, otherwise received. Think about this. Do you know all the names of the children of, of uh, Reuben? Do you know their names? Do you know the names of the children of Simeon, of Levi, any of their names? No, so now notice why this is a great blessing. You know, being one of, considered one of the twelve, they have a position of prominence, as I said, that they would, would not have otherwise received by this. And he goes on and says, In the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and he says this, And let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Verse 17, And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. So it says that this displeased Joseph. Now, uh, you know, obviously he's aware of that, and that's why he positioned them in such a way that the firstborn is the one that should receive the greater blessing. He should receive, you know, superiority or precedence over the younger, and that's why he is displeased. He is aware of this, of course. And then he tells his father, you know, uh, as if his father is not aware of what he did, that he didn't do it wittingly. He, he, he informs him, hey, not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Right? Put thy right hand upon his head. Now, why would he think that he wasn't aware of that? What's one of the things that why Jacob would think, or I'm sorry, Joseph would think that he maybe accidentally did this? Exactly. What happened when his, you know, when his children came up to him, what did he say? Who are these, right? So he's not even, think about this, he's not even able to tell that they are his grandchildren in the first place, let alone distinguish which one is which, you know, amongst themselves, right? So he's not even able to look at them and tell which is which of the two. You know, uh, of course not because we know that he wasn't able to even tell that they were his grandchildren in the first place. So that's understandable why Joseph would think that this was just, you know, a mishap or an accident. Now look at verse number 19. It says, And his father refused and said, I know it, my son. I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Now, I also believe that this proves that the Holy Spirit is involved in this, that God is involved, because when his children came up to him, his grandchildren, again, he wasn't able to recognize who, is, who was who. So it makes perfect sense that if he wasn't able to see them, and then now all of a sudden he's wittingly guiding his hands in such a way that God would be involved in such a thing going on. Now, look at what it says there in verse number 19. It makes a statement. He says, I know it, my son. I know it. He also shall become a people. Now, does that sound familiar? He also shall become a people. That's a very similar statement that, uh, you know, when God was dealing with Abraham. That's a very, almost an identical statement that, that God ended up making, the angel of the Lord said to Abraham, because Abraham said, would to God that Ishmael would live before thee, right? And that he would give the blessing to him. This was when he was at a moment where he was staggering in his unbelief. And then God ends up telling him at that time, you know, hey, he also shall be a people. And he talks about how he's going to build it. He's going to grow out and there's going to be kings that come out of him, right? And then we get the genealogy where there's dukes and all of that that come from him. And, but he, he, he tells him, hey, but Isaac is going to be greater than him. This is a very similar situation that we have going on right now as well where there's the, the firstborn and the younger. There's a lot of parallels right now. And the father is saying, hey, what about my eldest? And then God says, hey, he'll also be a people. In both situations, when... Superiority is given to who? It's given to the younger. It's given to the youngest of the two, right? So this happens, and this, this happens in a few different situations. First, I want you to turn to Luke chapter number 13. Luke chapter number 13. One of the, 
I wouldn't say one of, I would say the most notable situation is with Jacob himself and Esau. Think about that. Jacob, the one that is actually laying his hands on them and blessing them right now. This same thing happened to him. Who was older, Jacob or Esau? Of course, Esau was the eldest. And who ended up receiving the blessing in that case? Jacob did. So this happens oftentimes. Now, of the 12 tribes of Israel, who received the greatest blessing of the 12 tribes of Israel? That's Judah, of course. Is Judah the eldest? It's not. So oftentimes, the eldest doesn't end up getting it. You can see a pattern of this all throughout the Bible. Now, this is symbolic. I, I, believe, I don't think that this is an accident, all these different parallels. I believe that it is symbolic. Look here at Luke chapter number 13. I want you to look with me at verse number 30. It says this, And behold, there are last which shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. So notice that statement. Now this is made all throughout the Gospels, right? But notice that the Bible teaches that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Now what happened with Ephraim and Manasseh? That's exactly what happened. They were switched, weren't they? He actually puts the one in front of the other. He swaps and gives precedence to this one instead of this one, right? Now, in the context of this chapter, I want you to look up. Look at verse number uh, 28. It says this, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. Then he says this, And you yourselves thrust out. Who's he speaking to? Speaking of physical Israelites, right? Now, uh, of the children of Abraham, that is uh, Ishmael and Isaac. What does the Bible tell us in the book of Galatians? What does Ishmael represent? Right, he re he represent, Ishmael represents bondage, which is who? It's the Jews, right? What does Isaac represent? Exactly, the promise. Now, what happened with the two? The last shall be first and the first shall be last. Notice how there, there's this switching right there. And what happened with Ishmael and Isaac? Exactly that. The last was first and the first was last. You look that passage up in the New Testament and it's about the physical Jews who end up being last, right? And not being first. I want you to go back to uh, Genesis chapter number 48 with me. Genesis chapter number 48. So he tells them that he is also going to be giving a promise, just like he did with uh, the situation with Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael uh, uh, received uh, you know, a covenant, if you will. He received a blessing, right? Uh, but the greater blessing here, in this case, goes to Ephraim, who is the youngest. Who is the youngest? Look there at, uh, look at verse number 19. It says this, But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Now, I want you to think of this blessing here and tie it in with Genesis chapter 49. Do those blessings apply directly to the people that are living like themselves? Did the, the, and this is, this is another uh, good uh, um, angle to come at this with. The, the quotation... Uh, that we find in Romans chapter number 9 about Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Was that specifically about the men, Jacob and Esau? No, it was about the nations, wasn't it? Oftentimes the blessings and things like that and the prophecies that we find in Genesis 49 specifically, they're about the nation. So what he's talking about right now, of course, these are blessings that are going to come later, right? That, that they're going to grow into a great people, a great nation. When you look at Ephraim and you look at Manasseh, which of the two were larger? Which of the two had more power? Ephraim by far. Now Manasseh was split up, if you remember that, right? Because half of them stayed on the other side of Jordan, right? And then half came in, half of the tribe of Manasseh. But Ephraim ended up being huge. Ephraim, go to, go to uh, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 7. Ephraim ended up being huge. Ephraim was, ended up being such a large tribe that the entire nation of Israel would be referred to just as Ephraim sometimes. The whole nation of Israel, when God's speaking about the nation of Israel, He would just call it Ephraim because so many within the population of... so many within the population of Israel were made up of, you know, uh, Ephraimites. Now look here at uh, Isaiah chapter number 7. I'm going to give you a couple of... 
uh, places here. Isaiah chapter number 7. We're going to begin at the beginning of the chapter. Look at verse number 1. It says, And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that reason the king of Syria, I want you to pay attention, reason the king of Syria, and Pekah the son of, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, notice that, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. So notice that they were confederate with one another. This is uh, Syria and it is Israel. Look at verse 2. And it was told the house of David saying, Syria is confederate with who? Ephraim. Now who was confederate in the verse before? Who did it say went up together? It said Israel and Syria. It was the king of Israel and the king of Syria. And then you get to verse number 2 and it says, it's told the house of David. Now who's the house of David? That is Judah. That's that, Judah is the southern kingdom, right? And then you have the northern kingdom, which is the nation of Israel, which is also t called, like I said, like here we see it, the uh, Ephraim. So it says, keep reading and I'll show this to you further and then we have another passage we'll go to as well. It says, And his heart was moved and the heart of his people as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and, Jer and Shear Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. And say unto him, Take heed and be quiet, fear not, neither be faint hearted. For the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of reason with Syria and of the son of Remaliah. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee. Let us go up against Ju let us go up against Judah and vex it and let and let us so this is their counsel make a breach therein for us and set a king in the midst of it even the son of Tabiel verse 7 Pay attention to seven, uh, verse 8 specifically. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass, for the head of Syria is Damascus. Now what is Damascus? That's the capital of Syria is Damascus, okay? Now look at the next statement. And the head of Damascus is reason. That's the king, he's saying. Now look, and within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. Notice that. Be not a people. Look at verse 9. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. What is Samaria now? The capital of where? Israel. So what's it talking about when it says Ephraim? It's talking about Israel. It's very clearly speaking about Israel. And it goes on and says, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. Now, if you pay attention to genealogies uh, when, when, when they're given uh, uh, and where they come from and trace them back and everything, Jeroboam was from what tribe? Ephraim. Jeroboam was who? Who was Jeroboam? He was the first king when they actually split the northern and southern kingdom. So the northern kingdom is Israel. And the very first king of that nation was of the tribe of Ephraim. You see, you see how Ephraim receives great precedence or great you know, uh, 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 prominence later on from this blessing where they end up, and, and of their line, many of those that are, that are kings, it changes. There's other kings that step in. But very often there are many kings of the nation of Israel, of the kingdom of Israel, that once they split, that are of Ephraim, if you look them up. There are plenty of them that are from Ephraim. They definitely go back and forth and, and, and switch out, but many of them are from Ephraim, if you actually look it up. Um, I, want to, I, I, don't, I had that one memorized. I knew where it was, but let me look at this. I think I have it written down here. Uh, I want you to look at Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11. I was going to go to 10, so that would have been totally wrong. Isaiah 11. Also here, Isaiah 11, look at, look at verse 12. I think this is it. I'm not sure. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcast, this is it, and the outcasts of Israel. Okay, so he's going to assemble the outcasts of Israel. And he says, and gather together the dispersed of Judah. Now notice the north kingdom, the southern kingdom. Now watch again. From the four corners of the earth. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah. And it says, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. Now, if you read the whole context of this, he, just like in almost all the book of Isaiah, it's about the millennial reign. And what does he do? 
He's bringing back the kingdom. He's saying he's bringing all of Israel back. That's what the passage in the context, it's not very necessarily relevant to what we're talking about, but he's saying, go back to Genesis 48, please. He's saying that they're no longer going to be against one another, not going to be afflicting one another. He's saying the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom are going to be brought back together once again. Ephraim and Judah, which is saying Israel and Judah. So notice how, how much prominence that Ephraim ends up receiving, and it actually comes from right here. You read over these passages, you don't re realize the, the significance of these passages uh, sometimes. It's easy, just small things. You know, we'll look over and then uh, later on, you know, you'll be reading and you'll start understanding, wow, this blessing actually came, that was given to Ephraim, you know, actually came from that particular, uh, uh, or the strength that Ephraim has actually came from that particular blessing that his father Jacob gave him. So, um, Verse number 20 now, it says this, And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Now, there's a couple of things that I like about this statement where he says, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. Now, of course, he's uh, putting them in an order. You know, uh, Ephraim first and Manasseh second. He's saying as Ephraim and Manasseh. But also another thing that I noticed about, uh, about that is, you know, he says as Ephraim and as Manasseh, uh, Ephraim's name, uh, um, if you remember, Ephraim's name is actually, you know, Joseph is talking about how God has made me fruitful in this land, right? How God, and then Manasseh has to do with persecution. I'll tell you something super interesting about that. What ends up happening to at, at least half the tribe of Manasseh constantly? And, the, and Reuben, because where did they stay? On the other side of Jordan. And they're constantly getting attacked. What, what's happening? They're constantly being afflicted. Now Joseph was talking about his affliction and how God brought him through that affliction. Then here we see Ephraim. And what is the blessing? It's being fruitful and multiplying. It's saying he's going to be a multitude of nations. And what is Ephraim's name? The emphasis on being fruitful. Isn't that interesting? Even Joseph, when he named his children, uh, how it seems as if that could have been you know, divinely inspired in a way, right? Uh, and then he says, and he set Ephraim before Manasseh, right? So that's definitely an application there, the order that he names uh, uh, the two brothers. Verse 21, it says this, And Israel said unto Joseph, Now, He's, he's not always referred to as Israel. He's called Jacob very often. Actually, even in Genesis 49, he's called, he's called Jacob there too. But it's interesting when he gets into these blessings, how he's called Israel more often uh, uh, than he usually is. And I'll tell you why. It's because that, that, that blessing has to do with the nation of Israel. And I want to show you something real interesting right here that ties in with that. And Israel said unto Joseph, Before, Behold, I die. But God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. Now that, of course, ties in with Joseph believing what his father told him and that his bones would be carried out. You know, um, and that's talking about the great faith that Joseph had in God, right? The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Who's speaking these words? Jacob. You know what that proves? That he's speaking the word of God. That this is prophetic, what he's doing. Because Joseph's faith, it would, you know, does it matter whether or not you believe my words about something, my personal words? Of course not. You know, it, just my own words that are, that are estranged from the word of God. You know, obviously that's, if I'm speaking the word of God, then that has power. But it praises Joseph's faith. Now, wouldn't it be pretty vain just to praise his faith that he had just in his father, his father's own words? But of course it makes perfect sense that if he's speaking the word of God, why it would praise Joseph's faith in Hebrews 11 that he was going to have his bones carried out. So he believed that, obviously, and that ties in with, again, the promise of God and, and uh, them going back to the land. Now Joseph here, or I'm sorry, Jacob here, is, uh, he tells him, he makes a statement, he says, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you. And bring you again unto the land of your father. So that ties in with Joseph personally, but then also it is the promise that he's going to bring him out again. And this is the perfect parallel. If you ever write in your Bible, and I do, this is the parallel of Hebrews 11, where it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. It says they died in faith. It's saying at the end of their life, they died in faith. At, this is what? The end of Jacob's life. And that's actually, that, that quote is talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's, this is actually what it's referencing when it says they died in faith. This is that being, uh, when it's quoted, this is that being fulfilled. 
And he says, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you. Look at verse 22. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. This verse is extremely interesting. Super interesting. I want to show you something that's, that's extremely interesting and what we can learn from that. Now, number one, he says, Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren. What's he referring to when he says one portion above thy brethren? What's he referring to? What, is he, what did he just give? Now, like I said, this particular chapter is not dealing with the direct blessings of Joseph because they go to Ephraim and Manasseh, right? So notice how Joseph, by proxy, receives two portions because they're get, being given to his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So that's what he, he's talking about, that he has given one portion above his brethren. One portion of what? The land. One portion of the land, ultimately, look at the end of verse 21. It says at the end of verse 21, Bring you again unto the land of your fathers. What is the blessing? What is the, what is the blessing always speaking about? We're going to the land, inheriting the land, the land of Canaan. Even when he begins, he says at the end of verse 4, he says, And will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. The, the, the emphasis of the blessing is on the land, right? So he tells them right here, and when you look at the land, how in, in the way that it's divided, because there's other ways that they count the twelve, when it's divided, that's when Ephraim and Manasseh receive their own portion, and Joseph, through them, gets a double portion, right? So it's, by the way, the land is divided. And that's why Levi, they didn't have their own land, they just had the suburbs and stuff that they would dwell in. So one more time, notice this. He says, Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren. Then he says this, Which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Now, this is Israel speaking, right? Who are the Amorites? Who are the Amorites? They are uh, one of the groups, exactly. One of the, uh, the nationalities dwelling in the whole region of Canaan. Right? So he's saying that he took this from the Amorites. Now, let me, let me ask you this question. Does Jacob own that land right now? Does he have the land? It even tells you, I know I've, I've showed you this before, I believe it's in Acts chapter 7. Stephen, when he's preaching to the Jews, he, he clearly says that while Abraham was alive, that he didn't own any of it, not so much as to set a foot, his foot on. So he doesn't have any of it. So did he go in and take with his sword and his bow the land from the Amorites himself personally? No. The Amorites aren't mentioned prior to this. They're not brought up. They're not spoken of prior to this in the book of Genesis. Right? They're, they're, they're not talked about until 400 years go by and then they start to go into the land of Canaan at that point. Now he says, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite. Now who's speaking? Verse 21. It says, and Israel said. Who is that? Israel. He's speaking on, excuse me, he's speaking on behalf of the nation. He's speaking as the nation. I want you to go with me to Joshua chapter 24, verse 12. This is an extremely interesting verse here. Joshua chapter number 24, verse number 12. The answer to, to uh, a little... What seemed to be confusing to me right when I looked, on it, looked at it at face value is actually very simple. And I'll show you my thought process just to get you inside of my mind on how I was confused a little bit. So, I, that was re this, this verse when I was reading over it and listening to it the past few days stood out to me. And I started understanding what it meant. I was like, man, that's interesting. I was like, I wonder if there's ever anything about the Amorites that's spoken of later on in the Bible of when Israel... The nation of Israel, because I started to understand the concept that I just explained to you. When the nation of Israel takes it, well, look at this. In Joshua chapter 24, look at verse number 12. It says this. This is God speaking. Actually, back up, back up. Look at verse 11. And ye went over Jordan and came unto Jericho, speaking to the nation of Israel. And the men of Jericho fought against you. And the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I delivered them into your hand. So, God says He delivered them into their hand, right? Now, He mentioned all of them. Notice the Amorites were mentioned, right? But look at verse 12. And I sent the hornet before you, which drave them out before you. And then He says, even the two kings of the Amorites. So, He, he specifies the two kings of the Amorites, and He says this, but not with thy sword, 
nor with thy bow. Now notice what was specifically mentioned there. What? The sword and the bow. Right? And I was thinking like, but it said, Israel said that, it, that he was going to give it to him by his sword and his bow. But you have to read this in context specifically. What's the point? Now, now think about this first. Did Israel use a sword and a bow in this case, the nation? Did they fight? Did they actually engage in battle? They did fight. They actually went in and they did physically fight. They, over, they took the kings, remember, and were cutting them up and stuff. You remember when they lined them all up? The ones went into the cave. And they're like, bring them out, right? They, they used their sword and their bow, right? So they did actually use the sword and the bow. Israel did play a part in that, their aspect, you know, in that aspect. What is the point that God is saying? This is what, that was what threw me off. What was the point that God is making? He says in verse 11, And you went over Jordan and came into Jericho. And he talks about it, And the men of Jericho fought against you. But he says at the end, And I delivered them into your hand. So his point is that, Yeah, you used your sword and your bow, but it wasn't your sword and your bow that ultimately got you the victory. It was ultimately me that gave you the victory. That's proven further by, look at verse 13. And I have given you a land for which he did not labor. So notice he goes on to explain that he's the one that actually gave them into a land. And he even talks about he's going to send hornets before them. He's going to, make, he's going to cause them you know, uh, to be confounded when they fight. right? So they did obviously use the sword and the bow, didn't they? They did use the sword. We can, I could show you passages where they're fighting the Amorites and they're using the sword. So they are fighting against them. But God's point here is that you know, it wasn't the sword and the bow that ultimately got you the victory, right? David would go out and fight, but he talks about how he's not trusting in the flesh, he's not trusting in the arm, that it's God that gives him the victory, not the sword, not the bow, right? So, it's interesting there, verse number 12, how he specifically says, the two kings of the Amorites, and he says, but not with thy sword, nor with thy bow. Now, when you go back here to verse number 22, he says, Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite, he says, with my sword and with my bow. Who's speaking? Jacob. What's he talking about? The nation of Israel. Right? He's speaking as on behalf of the nation of Israel. Now, is it possible that Israel could have spoke or known such a thing without the Holy Spirit speaking through him about this? Is it possible that he could have said something like this without God's intervention? And knowing specifically that they're going to fight against the Amorites, that it's going to be sword and bow, and then you have this quotation? Of course not. He's just going to know, yeah, and then I'm going to give you this exact part of this land where the Amorites dwell? Of course not. So, like the Bible says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You know who's speaking through, Jacob? The Lord. So, that's why it says, I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. So you can look at it from the aspect like, yeah, Jacob, Israel had to fight, right? But ultimately, who's talking and who's speaking through them? You know, like when Isaiah stands up and he prophesies and he preaches, he says, I, even I am the Lord and beside me there is no Savior. Right? That's a man standing there saying this. But he's not talking about himself, the Holy Spirit is talking about himself through this man as an instrument. Well, that's what's going on here. That's why Jacob was able to wittingly move his hands and find, you know, uh, his sons. That's why he was able, that's why he goes on and he's able to prophesy in the next chapter. Because right after this, he calls his other children to him. He prophesies of Judah, how his eyes are going to be red, right, with wine. He talks about how the scepter's not going to depart from Judah and saying he, that's where the kingdom is going to be until Shiloh come. He goes on, talks about the colt, you know, binding his foal under the vine. Talks about how his, how his, how his, his, his garment is going to be uh, uh, dipped in, the, you know, the blood of grapes, it's worded in some way like that. These are all prophecies that Jacob would not be aware of on his own. So what's going on? The whole, this is, he's obviously right now, he's, he's prophesying. He's speaking by the Holy Ghost. And when you look at when Jacob makes the statement, he says, Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite, he says, with my sword and with my bow. Ultimately, who gave the nation of Israel that land? Who was it? Did they get it themselves? He says, you didn't labor for this. He says, I gave you this land. 
You know who's speaking through Jacob right now? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Spirit speaking through them. Jacob's prophesying, right? But it's actually God speaking. And God says, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite, He says, with my sword and with my bow. So further, I'll tell you a couple of things that are very interesting about this. And we're going to end. So He says, if you look at it, there you, you have I. That's you know, one application. You could say it's Jacob. You know, uh, speaking as Israel, but I, I believe that the primary and best application would for sure be God speaking. But both are true because, you know, you have God and man element, you know, uh, in the speaking of the Word of God, right? In the writing of the Word of God. They're both there. You see the personality of Paul in his writings, but it's also, of course, Scripture. It's the Word of God. Uh, and then not only that, it's interesting that this is past tense. Oftentimes, how do you see prophecies? Past tense. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Pleased is past tense. That's Isaiah 53 of the suffering servant chapter. Right? Had at that time in Isaiah 53 when that, was, that scripture was pinned down, had that already taken place? Nope. Often, very, very often, you know, like the Bible talks about, he calleth those things which be not as though they were. He will say that things are already fulfilled even though they had not taken place because he dwells in eternity. Right? He doesn't see things from beginning to end. You know, he's, he's dwelling in eternity. You know, like he says, he is, thus saith the high and lofty one which inhabiteth eternity, says in the book of Isaiah. So it's past tense, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Jacob makes a few statements. I want to end with this application. Jacob makes a few statements in this where he's just constantly praising God, thanking God for the blessings that he's given. One thing that he praises and thanks God for is he says, God hath showed me also thy seed. So he's thankful for his children. He's thankful for his children's children, God allowing him to see his grandchildren, right? Another thing that he says is that he says in verse number, we're going to quickly finish here in, um, oh shoot, where he talks about how God fed him. It's in verse 15. He says, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day. So notice he says, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day. We should never get to the point where, where we you know, start giving glory unto ourselves for anything. The Bible talks about in the book of Deuteronomy, when he's speaking to the children of Israel, he's bringing them into the land. He talks about the blessings of the land. He makes it very clear like, hey, you should never get to the point where you're saying, hey, look at the great things that I have gotten and that I have acquired for myself. Where you start to forget God, right? And he goes on to tell him that you need to thank God because God's the one in the first place that gives you the power and gives you the strength to go out and to get your food. We should always have the attitude that God, if you've been fed your whole life from, from the beginning of your life until now, God's the one that fed you. God, you didn't feed yourself. God fed you. And you know, it's good that when you sit down to pray with your children... You should pray and make statements like that and, and, and teach your children and make sure that they understand that the food that's on your table, you know, yeah, daddy went out to work, but it was by the strength that God gave him. Amen. That God's the one that allowed you to be able to bring this in. And all the things that, that, that you know, mommy does also, you know, the children need to be aware that she does those things by the strength of God. And that God is the one that gives us wisdom. God is the one that feeds us. You know, I love the way that's worded. God which fed me all my life long unto this day. God is the one that fed him. And then he, he ends there again. Of course, he, the, whole, the whole chapter is about him. You know, he's given the blessings, of course, but multiple times sprinkled in there, he's just giving praise to God. You'll notice that he does that repeatedly. Just praise to God. You know, the God that blessed me. God that did this. God, you know, allowed me to see you and... Because we, we, don't, we don't deserve anything. We don't deserve anything. You know, we may get to the point where we feel like, hey, I deserve this. You don't deserve anything. Everything that we get is just, it's, it's the grace of God. And that's the attitude that we should have. And we should constantly be giving glory and honor to God. And specifically, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every, every blessing that we give to God, every, you know, uh, uh, all thankfulness needs to go through, and glory needs to go through the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for all the blessings that you bestow upon us. We thank you.